First of all, you, you cut yourself or something there. You know, I burned my hand taking a pizza out of the oven. So it's not a, it's not a, very, uh, oh, a very major story, but... Turn uh, off the cameras. Yeah, really. Do you remember the first band that just blew you away? That changed everything? Well, I mean, in terms of records... Sure. In terms of records, it would have to be the Beatles. And, you know, I, I started listening to them for some reason when I was really, really little. So, you know, by the time I was a teenage hippie, you know, they'd set the groundwork for all this new thinking and new, new, new sort of trends and attitudes. And, and uh, you know, I kind of came to it as it happened, which was pretty interesting. I mean, the Beatles are obviously a band that changed everything yeah. for everyone. But, you know, even Sonic Youth had an impact out there. What, if, in your own world, in your own eyes, what kind of impact do you think you guys had? Well, I think when we started, we were kind of um, mining this certain kind of trend that was going on in New York. And, you know, in those days, it was like pre-internet. You know, the USA, on, like, you know, England had like three daily, three weekly music papers. So people were steeped in music. And here we had like Rolling Stone back then every other week or every month or something like that. And they didn't cover what was going on in New York. New York was kind of like this little island and there was all this weird experimentation going on there. You know, New York's always had that and still has it. Um, but I think when we first started, especially, we, we managed to leave New York quite early in our career, you know, way before all of our friends and bands were able to get out of New York and like go to Europe or go around the country, you know, things like that. And um, we were bringing these really weird experimental sounds and you know we were working with all these open tunings on our guitars and stuff and it didn't sound like anything else and you know we had absorbed all this stuff that was going on in New York DNA and contortions and you know teenage Jesus and the jerks and talking heads and television and the Ramones and you know and the heartbreakers and the and the voidoids and if you didn't live in New York at that point most of those bands never got out of New York so you didn't really understand it you know maybe you'd read a little blurb about it but we were kind of influenced by all that stuff and we were bringing a lot of that stuff out into the world so you know especially in our early days we sounded like nobody else and we just approached our music like nobody else and people were pretty shocked and surprised by it at first well it's interesting because you know like you said before there was no internet there was nothing like that mm -hmm. so I almost feel like if, if, if you guys were to come out today it'd be a completely different experience because people would be able to already hear those yeah. bands. Yeah. You wouldn't be carrying that New York torch for you know, yeah. a lack of a better way of putting yeah. it. Yeah, no, it would, be very, it would be very different today. You know, the whole music scene is so different today. Everything is so different today. But, you know, in the old days, you'd like scour album covers and you'd read people's names, you know, like, uh, I don't know, like Neil Young record produced by, produced by Jack Nietzsche. Like, who is this guy? And it might take you three or four months to find out who he was. And in the, in the process, you'd discover all these other the records. And, <laughs> you know, yeah, you'd go down these physical wormholes. And now you, you push a button and you get your answer and you kind of go on to the next thing. Right. And that sense of discovery has changed in some ways. You know, over the course of our career, we got to meet and, like, be involved with many different heroes of ours. You know, we toured with Neil Young. You know, we've met, you know, all different kinds of people. Um, on our first, on our second record, our first kind of full-length album, we did a, a cover of uh, uh, Stooges' I Want to Be Your Dog song. And, you know, that was actually recorded at the 40 Watt in Athens. In Athens. Oh, no, 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 sorry. It was recorded at the Cat's Cradle in, in, in North Carolina. Um, which we also just were a couple of days ago. <laughs> sure. I was mixing it up. But uh, in like 86, when we were in England, when we were starting to get popular in England, we were rehearsing and we we'd resurrected that song. We were doing I Want to Be Your Dog. And we were in this rehearsal studio and Iggy was rehearsing a group in the next room. And we'd never met him at that point. And somehow our English manager kind of uh, uh, organized a little bit of a meeting. And so we were like, you know, why don't you come down and see us? We're playing at this, this place called The Town and Country tonight. And he was like, yeah, I'll come down. And we're like, you know, by the way, we do I Want to Be Your Dog, just in case you're interested, you know? And he came down, and he had like a super cool leather jacket on, and we're, you know, we came off after the uh, main set, and we're like, we're going back to the encore. We're like, hey, you want to come out with us? And he was like, yeah, I think I'll do it. And, like, and it was <laughs> such a thrilling thing to be on stage, like playing that song. And, you know, at that time, he, you know, this was before he reformed the Stooges. He had like, sure. sort of like uh, pickup bands practically, you know, like Chuck Berry style. And 
people told us that like we were the, the best band that backed Iggy up in, in like five years at that point or that. since the Stooges or something. <laughs> and, and you know, we stayed friends with him uh, since that point, which was kind of thrilling in and of itself. So um, that was an early, like really amazing thing. You know, we had encounters like that all, all along, yeah. you know, with people living in New York, there's... You mentioned you know, Neil Young. Yeah. Did you pick, did you take anything away from Neil Young? Well, a lot of stuff about the way that he toured and the way he operated and stuff. When we toured with him, it was the early 90s, and, you know, he was a big deal, obviously, at that time. But he had a, you know, he had a road crew. We were playing arenas, and, you know, and, and we'd never played anything that big before. So we learned a lot from him just about how you deal with the, the big stages and the big rooms and everything. And... You know, he really responded to what we were doing. You know, we were getting booed a lot on that tour. You know, it was the first tour that he ever had uh, an opening act. And so, you know, people would come and they wanted to hear Neil. You know, they didn't want to hear us or whoever else was on the bill, Social Distortion or whoever it was. And so, you know, we got booed a little bit, but every night we'd come back off stage. And, you know, on the one hand, the booing just made us, like, do our thing even harder. Because, you know, it was like, all right, we're going to do our thing. Don't like that noise? Here's some more of it. And and (laughs) Neil would just be like, man, that was great. Like, don't pay any attention to those idiots. Just, like, do your thing. I love what you're doing and stuff. So he encouraged us a lot. And we managed to stay friends with him. So, you know, to this day, we see him if he comes through town and stuff like that. That's great. You know, he's been such a huge inspiration that it's been been amazing to, to get to know him even a little bit, you know. I do, I do sketches in the car sitting in the front passenger seat of the, the road going by, the landscapes. And I've been kind of doing that the last four or five years all over the world. And I got a really good batch of them yesterday that I put up on my Instagram feed. And then sometimes I sell them at the shows or exhibit them in galleries and things. And so that's, that's one thing I've been doing a lot right now. I'm having a big art show in uh, October and I'm blowing some of them up bigger on canvas and okay. things like that. And the other thing I do is I, I've always been a printmaker making uh, etchings and things like that. And these days I, I make what they call dry points on old vinyl records and I, sc- I scratch them up and work on them and then I print them and make small editions of them like editions of 10 or something is like that. Is there a that. method to the madness when you're scratching it? Um, you know, all different kinds of things. It's always about trying to get different tones or, you know, there's, you, when you print it, you already see the grooves of the record. So, you know, I'm sort of, sort of viciously scratching on top of that in yeah. different ways. You know, different ones take different forms. Have you found that different bands have a different vibe to it? <laughs> you know, I usually use records that are like old and beat up to begin with. So it's not like I'm choosing my favorite pavement record to scratch <laughs> on or something like that. I'm keeping those. Why did I do that? Art in 2017, what's more satisfying? Uh, people seeing the art, buying the art, or getting like a lot of people on Instagram going, that's awesome. Well, you know, they're both really interesting. I, I love Instagram. That's my social media feed because, uh, mainly because it's about, you know, images in a very poetic way and there's not a lot of blather and smoke about it. So uh, that's, that's my favorite thing. I do Instagram almost exclusively. My Instagrams go to like Facebook and Twitter, but I, I don't usually go on those platforms. I just do Instagram and I love to see what people do on Instagram just because it's always really inspiring. So, but, you know, as you know, I consider that just as much an art medium as, as exhibiting in the gallery. So, you know, they're both good. Besides your art, besides your music, <laughs> this is Hidden Talents. Okay. What hidden talent do we not know about you? Well, um, you know, we would, I would have talked about cycling and tennis and some of that kind of stuff. But I guess um, one of my hidden talents is that I have, I'm, 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 a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a good cook. In yeah. certain areas, I'm assuming. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, my 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 wife usually makes the pizzas, and she wasn't feeling well that night. And I don't know I just somehow touched my arm to the door of the, of the stove. But I'm a, a soup maker and a pie maker, and I've got the pie thing really dialed in at this point, making the crusts and all that stuff. And and I've got a few soups that um, are always being clamored for in our house. You know, so I like to cook. Okay, if I you were hosting the everything. Queen of England at your house, which soup would you make for her? Well, I make this soup that they call Italian wedding soup, and it's uh, little tiny meatballs in a soup broth, uh, like a chicken stock broth with spinach and, and, and a pasta in there and a lot of vegetables, and it's, it's a pretty awesome soup. And, and occasionally I make a pretty mean uh, fish soup. A fish so, soup? Yeah, like a, like a, I don't know, like that kind of French style uh, 
soup de poisson. I don't know what we would really call it, like a thick uh, fish soup. Do your kids like your cooking? Yeah, they like it. They like yeah. it. And you know, the pies are the pies are pretty special. So I'd probably make uh, which, which make pie her an apple get? pie or a queen uh, or a, a, a pecan pie or something like that. You know, I like to make fruit pies and pecan pies. I've been trying to make a little bit more these days. I burned my hand taking a pizza out of the oven.